Thank you, Samuel. So welcome everyone again. I'm happy to have everyone here. I just want to jump right into it because I do believe that the Lord is going to, what, what the Lord desired to do with this teaching series. So I don't know if this is internationally, but I know that in America, the month of May is mental health month. So I'm calling it like a national thing. I don't know if it's is honored in other places in the world, but in America, um, the month of May is known as mental health month. And like, since the beginning of the year, the Lord said to me, this month of May, I want you to begin to talk about mental health in the kingdom of God. And one of the things that I saw in the spirit just now, as we were praying, what God is going to be doing as we go through each Thursday and we're going through this teaching, I see people coming out of the cave. You know, there, there's certain things that was wrongfully taught to us in the body of Christ as it pertains to mental health that has, that has drawn that has put us into a cave where we believe that there are certain emotional things that we should not express. There are certain mental things that we should not ask for help for or we should not express and it has drawn us into a cave. One of the plans of the enemy, when you when you look at when a lion, because the, the Bible described the enemy as like a, 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 a roaring lion or a prowling lion. And a lot of times when, what I love with the scripture and what I always encourage with you is when the Bible describe a spirit with, um, by using the metaphor of an animal, you understand how that spirit works by studying the characteristic of the animal. So when the when the Bible described the enemy as, as a roaring lion or a prowling lion seeking for whom he might devour, when you, I used to watch a lot of Animal Planet and Discovery Planet, right? When you look and you see an a, a lion hunting. He often goes for the person or the ant. He always go for the animal that is that's in the back. That's but that's behind the herd. That is lingering in the back. That's probably by itself. That's isolated or that's um, limping or already injured. And what the Holy Spirit began to show was that there are many people in the body of Christ who are behind the herd because of some mental illnesses that they're dealing with. There's some 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 um, malfunctioning, so to speak, in their mental health, and that has caused them to be limping. It has caused them to be wounded. It has caused them to be isolated and by themselves, which makes you an easy prey for the enemy. So the Lord desire, as he used me to teach every Thursday in this month on this topic, is to bring you from behind the herd and bring you in, in with the collective group and to bring you from a place of limping and woundedness where you're now fully affecting where your eyes feet are no longer broken your eyes feet are no longer limping so i want you to take copious note mentally and spiritually and written as as we're going through this right so today we are focusing on debunking the myth of mental health in the body of Christ. D, but there are a lot, there's a lot of myth when it comes to the body of Christ, when it comes to mental health and the church. There, there are churches that don't even talk about mental health. There are church leaders that don't even believe that mental illnesses is a mental it, mental illnesses is a thing. So we're gonna debunk a lot of that tonight, and I'm trusting that many of us will be free. And I'm saying us because I'm, you know, when I teach, I include myself in this because God is talking to me as well. So many of us will be free from a mental and emotional state of being. So before we can even go into debunking myth, we first have to understand what is mental health. There's two terms that we want to understand, mental health and mental illnesses. They're not the same, but mental illnesses fall under mental health. When somebody talks about mental health, they're not necessarily talking about a mental illness. Um, but if somebody's talking about a mental illness, they're talking about your mental health. So mental health is the umbrella. Mental, Ill, mental illness falls under mental health. So by the grace of God, I'm going to be using the, the, the wisdom that the Lord has given me, and I'm going to incorporate some of my own expertise as a social worker and a life coach. And I feel like that's how God wants me to bring forth this teaching. So when you think about mental health, mental health is your emotional, psychological, and social state of being. It is your state of being. It is, it is your well-being on an emotional level, on a psychological level, on a social level, because when you're not when, when your mental health is off, then socially you're also off. So we want to also include that social piece in it. So again, mental health has to do with your emotional, psychological, and social well-being. Um, mental health determines how you handle stress. 
It determines how you handle people. It determines how you handle things. It determines how you handle season. Your mental health even determines how you handle you. Your mental health determines how you handle your relationship with God. Your mental health even determines how you perceive the things of God. One of the things that you always hear me say is that it's very difficult and it's also actually it's not it's impossible to be emotionally unhealthy and spiritually wealthy there's no way you can be emotionally unhealthy and be spiritually effective even with the spiritual gifts the spiritual gift your mental health can dictate and determine how you function in your spiritual gift for example if you have if, if if you're broken emotionally then then that emotional brokenness or that psychological brokenness can determine can uh, cause you to interpret a prophetic word or a prophetic revelation through a broken lens. So that it is super important that you check your emotional state of being before you even try to function in the gifts of the spirit. A lot of people get it wrong because emotionally and mentally they're, they, they're unstable. Emotionally and mentally they're unhealthy. So you want to the two, the two come, it, it goes hand in hand. You can't be so focused on being spiritually wealthy and not emotionally healthy. You need to be emotionally healthy so you can be spiritually wealthy. So that, that when you think about mental health, that is the context, right? When you hear mental illnesses now, mental, mental illnesses, it has to do with things like depression. Um, it has to do with things like anxiety, things like bipolar, things like exhaustion. Exhaustion is a mental illnesses is a mental health issue. So, you know, when you think about mental illnesses, it is an issue or something that affects your mental health negatively. For example, like a cold or a cough or a flu, it affects your body physically. It is the same impact that how like a, a medical problem has on your body is the same impact that a mental illness has on your mental health. So if you're navigating depression, if you're navigating anxiety, it literally affects your mental health. It declines your mental health. So you want to be mindful of what is mental health and what is mental illnesses. Mental illnesses is anything that negatively impacts your mental health. Some of these things are diagnosable where you can diagnose them and they're in the DSM-5, which is a DSM-5 is a psychological book that has all of these diagnoses in it. And it tells you, oh, if you're experiencing these symptoms for the past three to five days, then this is what it is. It, it, it helps our mental health professional diagnose what you're dealing with. So I wanted to give you that concept before we go in. Let me jump right in. Let's begin to tackle and debunk some of the, um, the, the myth. I'm going to be using biblical evidence and also scripture and also this observation as somebody who's a social worker and a life coach. And God has graced me with the opportunity to, to coach and to counsel those who are also in leadership, in ministry leadership. One of the first myths about mental health in the body of Christ is just that oftentimes you will hear this, hear this, um, because you have the Holy Spirit, you're immune from mental illnesses. And that's not true. Having the Holy Spirit does not make you immune from depression. Having the Holy Spirit does not mean, and there's some people that's probably going to come from my head, but I don't care. We have Bible for this, right? So, so, so having, having the Holy Spirit, it does not negate the fact that you can experience stress. It doesn't negate the fact that you can become overwhelmed. It doesn't negate the fact that you can, um, experience, um, exhaustion. And we saw this even when Jesus said, um, God, not my will, but your will be done. He was, we can only imagine what he was feeling. And this was Jesus. Where he said, yo, yo, take this cup. <laughs> Literally, I don't want nothing to do with this God. If you could take this by the end of the day, not my will, your will be done. So we saw that Jesus himself, you know, was experiencing mental exhaustion. You know, um, he was probably experiencing anxiety because he knows that his debt was drawing nigh, even though he was, and the, the crazy thing is, he knew why he came on earth. He knew that these things was why he came. And even though he knew in advance, it still did not impact the fact that he was feeling anxious and it still did not negate the fact that he was feeling overwhelmed and exhaustion. Why? Because of the flesh. 
you, we have to understand that even though we may have the Holy Spirit in us, we are also a human being. When you begin to understand that you are a spiritual being, but you're also a human being, then you understand and it makes sense why you can have the Holy Spirit and still navigate stuff that the, the, the human body has to deal with. You have a spiritual makeup, but you also have a biological makeup. We cannot negate that fact. The Holy Spirit does not negate the fact that you're a human being in a flesh with biological makeup, with a brain that has chemicals and, and protons and neurons and all of that stuff. Like it is still, it still exists. What the, what the presence of the Holy Spirit does it it can help you to navigate these things if you allow it but even then you may need additional help so the first thing that we want to debunk is that you're not immune from mental illnesses because you have the holy spirit in you you're not immune from mental illnesses because you have a strong anointing on your life um prophet jeremiah you know, while we can't say that he had the Holy Spirit because it wasn't functioning then, but he had a strong anointing on his life. He had a powerful relationship with God. There, there's some people in the body because they will tell you, oh, uh, if you have a relationship with God, then this wouldn't be happening to you. And that's not true because we see where prophet Jeremiah, he was known as the weeping prophet. He dealt with loneliness. He dealt with insecurity. He even cursed his own life. Let, let's, let's look at the Bible. I think this was Jeremiah 20 verse 14, where he said, curse be yet. I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate my birthday. Curse. I curse the messenger who told my father, the good news. You have a son. Let him be destroyed like the city of the old that the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long. So we saw Jeremiah got to a point where he was even cursing the day he was born. And this was a man that was God mouthpiece. He had a relationship with God. So that's one biblical example. The first, the second biblical example, the first biblical example I gave was Jesus. We can't, we can't negate the fact that he walked with the Holy Spirit. He walked with um, God. But at some point in his journey, he said, God, I'm tired. Not my will, your will be done. Exhaustion. 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 We saw Paul. We know Paul to write majority of the New Testament, right? And there was a point where Paul said, he, that, that he doesn't have it all together. This was Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. He said, I am not saying that I have it all together or that I have made it, or that I'm, but I'm well on my way reaching out to Christ who has wondrously reached out for me. So we hear Paul even saying that, hey, I don't have it all together. And I'm doing this ministry work from God. And I, I'm speaking in tongues. And he said, I think he, at one point, he said he's speaking in tongues more than anyone else. So we, we, we're hearing the, 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 the apostle who say he speak in tongue more than anyone else, saying that he doesn't have it all together. We're in the flesh. So you have to begin to understand that you're, you're a spiritual being and you're also a human being. So you need to give yourself grace as people who, who walk with Christ. And, and do not let anyone say to you, oh, because you have the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't be experiencing this. It's not Bible. So that's the first thing we want to debunk, right? The second thing we want to debunk is that prayer alone will eliminate and control mental illnesses. That's not true. I, I, Paul prayed. I'm sure Jeremiah prayed. Dave, David was a, God of, a, a man of God's own heart. He prayed. But we saw how many times David is like, oh, David went through depression so many times. Oh, God, you have neglected me. You forsake me. You this, you that. And even in the midst of his, his Psalms, one in one verse, he will be bigging God up. And then in the next verse, he's saying, hey, like you forgot about me, what's going on? So we, we understand prayer is a powerful tool. Prayer, it, it, it does give God access to do things on earth. God cannot do anything on earth without prayer or anything through it. He, prayer is the invitation. It is a red carpet that allows him to roll out and come into our life. But prayer alone does not eliminate mental illnesses. Let me give you an example. When Elijah, after he just went up against, what, the 800 or 750 or something prophets, he beat them up. He won the fight. And then shortly after, he ran to a cave and he was saying that he wanted to die. He was basically experiencing depression. 
And in my experience, I would say, you know, not only depression, but he will also have a sense of exhaustion and anxiety. A lot of times people viewed it and, and viewed it as though he was afraid of um, Jezebel. But I don't think Elijah, who just took down a whole army of false prophets, was afraid of Jezebel. I think what happened was that he was exhausted. Because another thing that people don't understand, when you function in the gift of the spirit, especially the prophetic, and especially if you do deliverance, you become exhausted. You can, your, 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 human, your, your human self become exhausted. You know, your spirit man may still have the drive to go, but your human self can easily become exhausted. So I don't believe that it was fear that made Elijah run to the cave and started to say that he wanted to die. It was exhaustion. Imagine taking down 800 prophets, approximately 800 prophets. You're tired. It was a one man going against all of them, calling out fire from heaven and all that good stuff and getting woods to be burned after they were drenched with water. He was exhausted. What did God say to him? God told him to eat and sleep. So there are certain times when you're praying against, oh my, I'm feeling exhausted, I'm feeling depression, and you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, you're praying, and it's not working. And sometimes God is saying, go sleep. Go eat. Take a time off. Let me tell you something. Rest is important. We serve a God of rest. How do we know that? Psalms 23, he's the God of the still water and the God of the green pastures. And let me show you even something. He said, I will lead you beside the still water. He said, I will lead you in green pastures. I will lead you beside the still waters. I will restore your soul. Then he will lead you in the path of righteousness. You notice what he did before he led you in the path of righteousness? You went, he led you beside the still waters. He led you in the green pastures. He restored your soul, and then he put you on the path of righteousness. Imagine if he had put you on the path of righteousness without the green, green pastures, without the still water, and without the restoration of your soul. You will be, that, that, what is I saying to us? That, they, that the path of righteousness, to walk the path of righteousness, require a level of rest. It require a level of restoration. It requires a level of stillness, green pastures. So there are times when it's okay to take break. It, it's okay to take time to rest. So prayer alone does not eliminate our control mental illnesses. It does not. Sometimes you need a therapist. <laughs> Sometimes you literally need someone that you can talk to. Sometimes you need a safe space. So that's, that's the second thing we want to debunk when people, oh, just pray about it. Yeah, I have. I literally just prayed a whole three hours. I'm still depressed. <laughs> I'm still exhausted. Don't there are times I'm like, don't tell me to pray. <laughs> you know, I used to be when one time my grandmother and I, and I was explaining to my grandmother what I was going through at one point. She said, Oh my grand, you know, all the people, they're gonna give you the best that they can give you. And my grandmother was like, Oh, my grandson, just pray. And I said to my grandma, I was like, Grandma, I don't need prayer. I've been praying. You taught me how to pray. I was raised by a praying grandmother. I, my issue is not praying. My issue is I am truly just tired. And that's normal. Why? The flesh. We have a biological makeup. So there's sometimes where it's prayer is not what you need, but you need rest. Sometimes prayer is not what you need, but you need a company of good fellowship and then good friends to go out and eat and fellowship. Right. This, the, the third, the third, the third um myth that we want to debunk, and I hear this so much in the body of Christ, that as long as you have Jesus, you don't need nobody. You don't need a support system. We saw Jesus, right? He had 12. If Jesus needed 12, who are we not to need a support system? What, what, what we want to understand that is that even when we have a support system, we should let Jesus be the center of it. Let God be the center of it. But having a relationship with Christ doesn't mean that you don't need a support system. The Bible said where two or more is gathered, he appears. That means that in the company of somebody else, haha, it, it, it activates the presence of God. He didn't say where one is gathered, because one can't gather. He didn't say where one person calls on my name, I am there. He said where two or more, a company, a fellowship, he is there. So we see the, a, God, a, a God that encourages us to have fellowship with other people. It is not safe to say, oh, all I need is Jesus. 
Because there are certain things that Jesus is going to do in your life that he's going to do it through people, your support system, your circle. Jesus had a 12. And from the 12, he had a three. And from the three, he had a one. I'm here to ask you, where's your 12? Where's your three? Where's your one? It's a myth. I'm not saying that Jesus can't do it. I'm not saying that Jesus is not capable of doing it. I'm not saying that you don't need Jesus. Please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. We need him, but not at the expense of a support system. We need him and the support system. Because guess what? He will, provide, he will provide the support system. A lot of times people are isolated in their home. And sometimes you find yourself praying by yourself and you're so exhausted and you're so tired and you cannot tap in. I'm telling you, I, pr I love praying. But I'm going to be honest with you and tell you, there are times when I'm so overwhelmed with the issues of life that I'm trying to tap in by myself and I can't. I need somebody else. That's why I have a prayer partner. That's why my grandmother and I pray every morning at 7 a.m. for the past seven to eight years consistently. We don't miss it. We need a prayer partner. We need a group of people because there's going to come a time where you're trying, to, you're trying to tap into Jesus by yourself and you just don't have the zeal. You don't have the strength. And it doesn't mean that you're less holy. It doesn't mean that you're, a le you're the less child of God. It doesn't mean that you're in sin. It literally means that you're exhausted and you're tired. And even even Moses in the battle of Raphadim needed two other people to hold his hand up, up so he could have victory. So if all these great men of God, at some point, Elijah went and found Elisha. So if all these great men of God had people, if Jesus himself had people, who are you to say you, you don't need a support system? It, was, it wasn't it God that said to Moses, um, um, you can't do this by yourself. Uh, uh, let me put your spirit in the elders and let the, help, the elders help you do this. Your walk with Christ is not a lone wolf thing. So you need to get rid of that lone wolf ideology. There's going to be a season where God will separate you from the pack. Huh? To deal with you, but then he will send you back to the pack. He's not a God of isolation. He's a God of separation. There's a difference between isolation and, and, and separation. He's a God that separates you for a certain time. But he's not going to ever say to you, don't go back to your circle. He's not. There's a difference. I don't have time to give you the definition now. You can look it up. There's a difference between isolation and separation. They're not the same. <laughs> you could be separated and still have and people can still have access to communicate to you you can be separated and still have a level of communication and a level of interaction but you're separated to a certain extent isolation is when you close everything off you need a support system you need a support system i don't know who this is for you need a support system can't do it by yourself. You were never called to do it by yourself. The walk with Christ is not a lone wolf thing. It is not a lone wolf thing. You're not called to do it by yourself. The, 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 the other um, myth that I want to debunk is that because you look healthy um, on the outside means that you're fine. One thing with us in the body of Christ, we know how to put up a facade. We are the kings and the queens of facade. We know how to put up a facade. We know how to put on our Sunday best, and we know how to put on our best outfit. We know how to put on our best hallelujah praise. Ha! Huh? You ask somebody, how are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm a money magnet full of love. And the moment they walk in the, into the, the parking garage of the church, they put a cigarette out and start smoking a cigarette because they stress. We, you, as you walk with Christ, you need to do away with the facade. There needs to be a level of transparency. And I get it. A lot of us are struggling with church hurt. And because we're struggling with church hurt, it, it makes us don't want to confess. It makes us don't want to be transparent. But let me give you a different perspective. While, it, it, you know, when we experience hurt at our job, we don't call it job hurt. When we experience hurt in our family, we don't call it family hurt. But then when we experience hurt in the church, 
we call it church hurt. And that's a very dangerous title. You know why it's a very dangerous title? Because then it now magnifies it magnify the, the hurt and point fingers to God. It, I, 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 God had to correct me one day. He said, it's not called church hurt. I said, then what is it? He said, it's hurt that you experience in the church. When you go to the bar and you get hurt in the bar, you don't call it bar hurt. You don't call it school hurt. When they bullied you in school growing up, you don't call it school hurt. But the enemy has, uh, ha has allowed us to develop this language where we're saying church hurt. Because then now when you think of it, church hurt, the first, and you see what's happening? The word church comes before the word hurt. So then you, you begin to attach that pain to church people. You begin to attach it to the church building. And you, then you ultimately begin to attach it to the head of the church. So you want to, and it, 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 it sounds bad, you want to get to a place where you understand that you're going to experience hurt wherever you go. What we need is a safe, a safe space. And so we can be able to be transparent. So we don't have to, because people believe that once you look good on the outside, then you're okay. If you're, in, you know, one of the reason why I'm a big worshiper, I prefer hymns over them jump you know them christian songs that make you jump and uh, 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 you will never see uh, you will never see me jumping i'm sorry <laughs> I, I dance and i'll run when the whisper come on me but one of the things about praise song you can easily hide your pain under a praise because praise doesn't require anything of you it's not sacrificial it's celebratory so you can easily jump by the beat of the song. But worship requires you to sacrifice something. Worship is sacrificial. Worship requires your heart. Praise requires your mind and your body. Because you just need your mind to remember. You just remember something good that he done for you and you start running. Or you remember the bad moment that you're in right now and you just start running. But worship requires you to give yourself, your heart. So I'm the kind of person is I'll pick worship over praise any day because I feel like in worship, I can be my authentic self. Because there are times I'm telling you, I'm, I don't, I'm not in the mood to jump and clap. I come into the church building. I'm here. I made it there. Thank the Lord I made it. But I'm broken inside and I'm bleeding internally. So I'm, I don't have the energy to jump. There are times when I went through depression, I went days without eating. I don't have the energy to jump because I'm afraid I might jump and I, and I faint on a hungry stomach. I'm not jumping and running on a hungry stomach. I'm sorry. So you got to understand that not because somebody looks good on the outside means that there, there's something not going on on the inside. Uh, uh, the people who are close to me, I, I, you will hear me say this to them and I, or I will teach up this concept. There's a difference between how are you doing and how are you being. When you ask somebody, how are you being? It has to do with their state of being internally, mentally, emotionally. How, when you say to somebody, how are you doing? It has to do with activity, the keyword doing. Somebody can be doing well, but not being well. Being is an inside thing. Doing is external. So somebody can be doing well, but not being well. So not because you look good out on the outside means that you're not, um, um, that you're 100% okay on the inside. That's a myth. And a lot of times we see sometimes, and that's why people, there's a saying that say, right? Check in on your strong friend. Why would you need to check in on your strong friend? Because a strong friend is always walking around looking strong. And if you if you just can if you allow if you just can if you constantly allow yourself to view the strong friend as the external demeanor, then you will never know what's really going on with them. Sometimes your strong friend is internally depressed, but because they always had to be strong, they don't even know how to express that and say, "Hey, I need help." So not because externally things look good on the not everything that glitter is gold. So not because you have external. Um, um, strength means that internally you're not navigating some hardship. So that's one of the myths that we want to debunk. Another myth that we want to debunk is that there's a myth in the church that say if you're following Christ, you don't need therapy, you don't need medication. Some of the most powerful breakthrough that took place in my life is when I sat in the seat of a Christian therapist across from me. I'm not saying go ahead and get any therapist, but there are Christian therapists that are tongue-speaking, Holy Ghost filled. And sometimes you just need a place where you can go to release what you're feeling that is not familiar. 
Sometimes you don't want to bring that weight on your friend. Sometimes you don't want to bring that weight on your family. And, and so you don't need to keep it inside. You could go somewhere that is that's unfamiliar and then allow it to become a familiar place, a familiar place for third for for, for therapeutic reason. Sometimes it's hard, it's hard for us to open to familiar faces. Sometimes I had to learn to open up to my circle of friends that I have now because I'm so always used to being strong. You know, even when I was growing up and, and everybody probably know my testimony by now, I went through homelessness as a teen. And one of the things that my mentor, and they mean me well, but one of the things some of my mentors used to do to me that really made me feel like I couldn't be human was when I would go to them and I would say to them, I'm tired, I'm depressed, I'm broken. And they would, be like to me, they would say to me, you're Rain Williams. Google your name. You just overcame homelessness. You was always in the news. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm telling you. The same person that was in the news and overcame homelessness, he's telling you he's tired. Why you can't hear him? He's tired. But some, sometimes it's hard for people to perceive our communication because you're so used to us being strong. But even the strong person has a weak moment. So not because you're following Christ doesn't mean that you don't need therapy. I'm I'm not the one to say, I don't promote medication right away. Because I feel like there's a lot of things that can be navigated without medication. So let me say that. But there are some things that if you try everything else, you try prayer, you try deliverance, you try everything else, and this problem still persists, maybe you, maybe you can try medication. I have no shame in the game to say back in, what, 2011, when I was diagnosed with severe depression, I was on like two different antidepressants and I was on them for a, a quite some time, probably like a year or two until one day God said to me, you don't need that no more. And I said, what? He said, flush it. Throw it, in the, <laughs> throw it in the toilet and I flush it. This whole time my doctor thought I was taking it. So she kept prescribing, prescribing and as she prescribed, I will flush it. And I'm not saying to do this. Don't follow me. That was my testimony. That was the grace that God gave me. But there was a moment when I was taking them bad boys every day and I used to call them the happy pill because they worked. <laughs> so you have to learn to, to, to assess where you are. Is it therapy? Is it medication? Be taking therapy, going to a therapist or taking medication doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you have less of the Holy Spirit in you. It means that you're human. Let me tell you something. Majority of us has endured trauma. Trauma has an impact on the brain. A lot of times when you go through very difficult things in life, the brain can even shrink. The brain can shrink in size due to trauma. So, so, and, and you have to also understand that, you know, you are also biologically make, made up, make up. So you have chemicals and stuff in your body. And there are times when your brain literally has a chemical imbalance and the medication helps to bring that imbalance. That's one reason why I would say, okay, medication is necessary. There are times when your trauma may be coming up on you because we have suppressed it for so long and now it's on the surface and you feel like you're drowning. And that may be the time that you may need to sit in the chair for therapy. Nothing is wrong with therapy. With therapy. My recommendation would be just seek God about the therapy, the therapist that you that that you 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 secure. I, I, I remember um I think I ended my therapy last year. Last year was the last, early last year was the last time I had to sit with a therapist, but I been in therapy since I was in high school, all the way up to last year, on and off, not consistently every year, but on and off, on and off, I'll make sure I find a therapist. But the last two therapists that I had were women of God. And I didn't know that there would ever be a time where you can open the Bible in therapy session. Now, I remember I met this um, therapist and I went to her and I told her and she was like, she said to me, um, what she said to me again? She said, are you ready to work? And I said, yes, because she said, um, I want to move you from the realm of coping and surviving to the realm of living. Are you ready to work? And I said, yes. And she shook my hand and she said, let's go to work. And I remember in that session, she would bring up the Bible and, and we would read scriptures. It will, it will be prophetic. She's prophesying to me. At some point I was prophesying to her and she's looking at me like, did you come to get therapy from me or did you come to give me therapy? But God will use you in that space. And that helped me. So many things was broken off of me, anger, 
um, trauma, addiction. If you know me, I, I, I dealt with addiction for at least 10, 13 years. Um, and when we think about addiction, addiction is, is not just substance abuse. You could have substance abuse addiction. You could have shopping addiction. You could have sex addiction. You could have um, Netflix addiction, all of that stuff. Like the, anything that you do in excessive amount to, to, to soothe something, can become an addiction. So a lot of times when people hear about addiction, they only confine it to substance abuse. It's not just about smoking weed or coke or pill or liquor or whatever. There's other addiction as well. So we want to debunk the fact that, oh, because we have the Holy Spirit or because we have Christ, we don't need therapy. <laughs> uh, YouTube could be an addiction. Hallelujah. Um, there was somewhere in the Bible, I think this was in James 5, where, where the Lord said, if there's any sick among you, right, let them call on the, 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 el the elders. I'm thinking that's probably in James 5, um, around that place, right? And, 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 and what he did say was, was, let them call on the elders and let the elders pray. But then God began to give me a different revelation about the elders. Yes, the elders are going to come and pray. But when we think of elders in our community, we think of those who have wise counsel, wise advice, um, wise revelation, wisdom to share, to impart. So I, I begin to believe that when the Lord said, if any are among you are sick, I'm also not, we, we don't want to confine that as just physical sickness. We want to expand that to emotional, mental, and physical sickness. You know, sickness is the umbrella that also encompasses mental sickness, emotional sickness, physical sickness. But oftentimes when we read that scripture, we can find it to only be physical sickness. No, 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 no. God told me to challenge you tonight and to tell you to think of it as every sickness possible that can happen. Mental illness, mental sickness is, is, is a sickness. But when he said, call on the elders and the elders will pray for you, I think the elders did more than praying. Maybe they gave some wise counsel before they pray, or maybe they gave wise counsel after they pray. There was a level of encouragement. There's a level of wisdom that was probably imparted and given onto you. So do we have to debunk the fact that because the, the, the myth that say because you have the Holy Spirit or because you have a relationship with God that you do not need therapy or you may never. Thank you, James five fourteen. I know I know it was somewhere in James five. Because it was right after that he said, you know, confess one to another so you may be healed. The, the, the other thing that we want to debunk, right, is that the church didn't talk about mental health. There's a big myth that say, oh, oh, it's like this, it's like this, this, it's like a separation of state and churches. Like as if the church is not supposed to talk about mental health. But if the church is supposed to be dealing with the healing of God's people, healing encompasses physical healing, emotional healing, mental healing. God is not God's desire that us in the body of Christ don't talk about how to navigate mental health. That's a lie of the enemy because one of the way how the enemy know that he can take you out from worshiping God is by coming for your mind. There's a scripture that say, love God with all your mind. If somebody can put it for me, love God with all your, your heart, your soul and your mind. So there are times when we're, keep, we're, we're loving God from our heart and our soul, but our mind is not involved. And he requires us to love him from all three aspects. The enemy will come after your mind because he knows that it will make you loving God ineffective because we're required to love him and serve him using all three. It didn't say love God with all your heart or all your soul, or, or, no, it said and. And is a conjunction that brings things together. So all of it is required. Matthew 22, verse 37. Love him with all your, 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 your heart, your soul, and your mind. And, and is the key word here. That means that you got to be able to do it simultaneously. What does that mean? That as you're loving him with your heart, your soul, and your mind is doing it together at the same time. It's like an engine working together. That's how you, that's how, that, that's when you will experience Jesus. A lot of times people go into prayer and they go into worship and they don't experience Jesus. It's because one of those things is not functioning. One of those things is not tapped in. You have, yes, you have to be able to worship him as a whole person, not as a piece of person. 
as a whole woman, not a piece of woman, as a whole man, not a piece of man. So one of the attacks of the enemy, the reason why he comes after your heart, he comes after your soul, soul ties, heartbreaks, and he comes after your mind, mental illnesses, because those are the factors that are required to experience Jesus. Ah. I prophesy that you begin to experience Jesus, that your worship and your prayer will not be in vain. You will experience him. Uh, some of the times you go into the presence of God and you're not able to taste him because your heart, your soul, and your mind is not working in conjunction together to, to worship him. So this is so if you want to understand why the enemy attacks my mind, why the enemy attacks my soul, why the enemy attacks my heart, is to disrupt your worship and to disrupt your you loving God. Mm. Hmm. Another myth. I'm coming down, y'all. I'll probably have a couple more, but I'm coming down. I'm trying to give y'all as much myth as possible to debunk this thing so you can perceive God, so you can experience God differently. Well, another myth that we want to debunk, right? There's a, there's a myth that say the moment you come to Jesus, he will, he will eradicate all your issues. And that is true, but it's also incomplete. And this is why it's incomplete. The myth says that when we come to Jesus or when we come to Christ and we baptize and we give our life to God, immediately everything will be eradicated. So if you come to God, you shouldn't have money issue. You shouldn't have heartbreak issue. You shouldn't, have, and that's a lie. And that's why a lot of people in the world don't come to Christ because that myth was fed to them. And then, and then when they come to Christ, they backslide because it was like, yo, I was told that if I come to Christ, this was not going to happen and this wasn't going to happen and this was going to happen. I'm experiencing some of the same problems I was experiencing in the world. Let me go back to the world. And that's why a lot of people don't come. Because us as the body of Christ, we have not been transparent with them. Let me tell you something that what I had to learn, why I stopped using the term church hurt, right? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes it's the worst. But one of the reasons why I stopped using the church, the, the term church hurt is because I God had to teach me that the church is just a group of people who are broken, trying to find healing while, while, while having a relationship with God. But the, 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 the myth that we project to the world is just that we are blessed and highly favored, full of love and overflow. We're never old. We're never stressed. We're never the lies. Anytime I've, every time I say to a Christian, hey, how are you doing? And they begin to give me that I am blessed and highly favored junk. I begin to block them out mentally. <laughs> I begin, the church is an emergency room. It's full of sick people. Thank you. Um, 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 Sister Annette, the, the, the church is an emergency room. It's like a hospital. It's full of sick people. And when you begin to understand that, then you begin to give other people in the church grace. And you begin to give yourself grace. We don't have grace for one another. Why? Because we have this myth that we're all supposed to be perfect. We expect Bobby in the world to step on our toe and don't say, excuse me. But if Sarah in the church who just came down from flagging and dancing, step on your toe and don't say, sorry, you internalize it because she's supposed to say sorry because she has a Holy Spirit. She has a Holy Spirit and she's still navigating hurt. She has a Holy Spirit and she's still navigating rejection. She has a Holy Spirit and she's still probably navigating a bad attitude. You have people in the church that has, sometimes it's not even a mental health issue. They just have a bad attitude or they're having a bad day or, or what? They're just human. So when we begin to understand that, yes, when we come to Christ, he's capable of eradicating. So, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you why this myth is a very dangerous myth. Not only just, not only it makes us not give grace to one another, but it also, and not only it pushes people away from coming to the body of Christ, but there's this dangerous thing that it does, right? If we expect God to immediately, as we dip in the water and come out, remove every problem, then how do we learn? We serve a God of processes. He's a God of processes. So there's certain things that God is going to do and eradicate from your life, and it's not going to be overnight. It's going to be through a process. You want scripture for it? It said, weeping endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. You have to go through the night. <laughs> you have to go through the night. You have to go through the night. The, and the night takes a time. It, you, you ever been sleeping and waiting for the sun to come up? And, and he's like, you're looking through the window like, yo, where's the sun? 
especially in America when uh, uh, in America when the, when we're in the fall season and the sun comes up at a later time, it could be seven a.m. and it's still dark outside. He's like, "Where is the sun? Where is the morning?" Sometimes God uses the processes, but as people, we want that quick fix. We want that quick fix, and that's how we find ourselves with addiction. And that's how we find ourselves struggling with pornography and lust and masturbation. Let me tell you something about lust. Let me take a little detour. The, we want to microwave Jesus, but he's not a microwave Jesus. He's a Jesus that you got to put the pot on the stove and let that rice simmer. Let that rice steam. Let that rice cook. We serve a Jesus who knows how to stir the pot. He doesn't prepare us in a microwave. He doesn't give us a quick fix meal, a, a, a three-minute meal. You know, he, he takes time to bake the chicken. We serve a God that understands the importance of processes. But let me go back really quick. A lot of times when people are struggling with things like, you know, um, you know addiction, whether it's like smoking, whether it's like masturbation, whether it's porn, and, and, uh, whether it's whatever, I'm just bringing up porn and, and, and masturbation because it's a thing that people in the body of Christ struggle with and we don't talk about it. A lot of times when we're struggling from those things, we're trying to fight the symptoms. Oh, let me not watch it. Let me not do this. But, but you have to understand that lust itself is a painkiller. Whenever you begin to operate in lust, lust is a painkiller. So in order for you to overcome pornography and to overcome uh, masturbation or to overcome whatever your lust are, are overeating, you, you have to first find the source of the pain. If lust is a painkiller, what pain is it soothing? A lot of time people fall in pornography and masturbation and other lusts, not because they're horny or lonely, but because they're sad, because they're unhappy because they lack confidence, because there's insecurity, or because they're lonely. So everything is not always because, oh, I'm falling into sexual sin because I'm, I'm, I'm horny. It, what, it, what is that painkiller soothing? So when you can find the pain and you can address the pain, then you no longer need the painkiller. <laughs> so we want to understand um, 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 that he's a God of processes. There's a lot of things that God is going to do in your life and he's going to do it through a process. But a lot of times we don't want the process because it takes too long or we don't want the process because we were told that Jesus is going to eradicate it and he's going to give us that quick fix. That's a myth that we need to tear down, throw in the shredder, shred it up, and never look at it again. He's a God of processes. He's a God of process. And the reason why he uses process is because he wants you to get the lesson. Because imagine if, if you, you just get a blessing or you get a healing and it just happened overnight like that with no process, you won't, you won't honor it. You won't honor it. One of the things that I, I had to learn, you know, that people will, will participate and honor what they pay for. And the payment is a, is a, is a process, the transaction. So if you host a free class. And people are going to come in that class as they like. They're going to come 30 minutes late, 10 minutes late. And then they're going to ask you, oh, um, did you have a recording for last night class? <laughs> um, and, 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 and then... And, but when somebody pay for something, they're going to show up on time because they value it more. The payment is a process. The payment is a transaction. When you, <laughs> I think uh, Sister Annette Cash, what I just did. Um, 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 <laughs> one second. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, when you allow yourself, right, to go through the process, you will honor the blessing. You will honor and value the lesson. Trust the process, but go through the process. He's a God of process. He's not a quick fix. He's not a microwave God. Uh, another myth that we, this myth gets me so mad, but I'm gonna try not to be mad right now. Another myth that we need to debunk, right, is that mental illnesses is your fault or it's a, or, or it's a result of your, your, you living in sin. That's not true. Sometimes you have not even done anything sinful. You've been holy for a whole week or probably a whole month or probably for like a whole year, but then you're dealing with depression. Don't let anyone ever make you feel bad talking about, oh, if you're going through depression, it's because you're doing something sinful in your life. Sometimes depression is just literally a genetic. It, it it's literally can be a genetic that goes on in your family. Some sickness 
whether it's physical or our mental, is genetic. You have no control over it. Sometimes it's biological. What, what are you going to say to a baby who, who was born with, with crack in their body or some kind of um, substance in their body? That, oh, it was your fault that you're dealing with. It. I'm, I'm going to look at you like, I didn't tell mommy to smoke crack or daddy to do this. So 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 it, you, we want to debunk the myth that, that says that, you know, if you're navigating some kind of emotional pain or some kind of mental illnesses, that it is your fault. There's some times when we do have a role to play in it. For example, like if you, you see some red flags in a bad relationship, but you stay there, and you don't leave after you saw the red flag, then you have a role to play in that because you could have left when you see the red flags and it could eliminate some of the pressure and the pain that you had to deal with. But that's a, that, that, you know, that's one side of the story. But majority of the time, people are navigating things that they didn't even bring up on themselves. Like you're, you're, you're navigating insecurity and you're navigating depression because you were molested as a child when you were seven years old. You didn't tell the person to molest you. You didn't say, oh, here's my little body, take me. So then how does that now become your responsibility? There are certain things that was inflicted upon you as a child. Let me tell you something. One of, one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is childhood trauma. Because he knows that, because remember, as a child, you get your sponge, you soak things up. So the enemy knows that if he can put certain things and inject certain things in your vein, as a child, it will grow with you. Certain things that you struggle with now as an adult was a seed that was planted in your life as a child that wasn't uprooted by your parent or your, or, or your caretaker or some or, or sometimes your parent and the caretaker who's supposed to protect you is a person that caused you the harm and the pain. So, 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 so childhood trauma is so real. It is so dangerous. It's one, it's one of the, it's one of the tactics and the strategies of the enemy to take you out since you were young. And he's not just doing it. Let me tell you somebody who, who in the Bible who had childhood trauma. Moses. Imagine as a baby, the, there was a, there was a bounty put out on young babies to be killed. And as a baby, your mom had, you, she, I could only imagine Moses' mother didn't get any time to really be a mother to him because she had to be hiding him. When did she get time to love on him and give him a good feeding from her nipple and really be a mother to him? And she constantly has to hide him because the soldiers are looking for baby boys to kill them. And then on top of that, she put him in a basket and he was down by the river. <laughs> Down by the rivers as a little baby, now you, you, you're going down by the river in a basket to a strange place and a strange family raised you. That's trauma. That's trauma. The Bible don't talk. You so sometimes when we read these people's story in the Bible, we read it as like a quick fix, like a quick thing. But we don't really like read it from a human perspective. So we read Moses and oh yeah, he parted the Red Sea and he this. But Moses had trauma. Imagine as a baby, your mother didn't get no real time to spend with you because she constantly had to run and dodge the soldiers who were looking to kill her baby boy. And then she had to put him in the river and send him down the river in a basket, hoping that he doesn't drown. Like what if the, the basket had tilted over and he drowned or something, the, the ties comes in stronger. You see what I'm saying? So, so you, you, we can see when you begin to view Moses' story from a human perspective, we read these people's story and we forget that they're human. And that's not cool. They are a human being. And when you begin to understand that these people are human beings and God used them mightily, yes, rejection. When you begin to understand that these people are human beings and God used them mightily, then you have grace on yourself. Because sometimes when we read David and we read Moses, we're like, oh, I want to be like Moses. But we are only saying that because we're only seeing how God, ah, machine for bed. How can I forget that? What's one of my favorite stories? How he was dropped. Let me tap into that a little bit, right? Let, let me tap into that a little bit. We can't, we can't hold Meshifabet accountable for him being crippled. Uh, his caretaker meant well. When she heard that Saul died, and then she, because remember, Meshifabet is Jonathan, 
son, which makes him Saul grandson. When she, when the, the caretaker heard that Mich um, Saul died and Jonathan died, she immediately think in her mind, yo, Meshifa bit is probably going to be the next in line to be king because he's a male and he's coming from this royal family. If they take out Jonathan and take out Saul, they're coming from Meshifa bit. Let me go hide this young, let me go hide this baby. She picked him up in with good intention and she was running with him and he fell and became crippled. A lot of times, and 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 let's let's look at this deeper. Let me let me bring some social work in this. Let's look at that crippleness in a metaphor kind of way. You were dropped. Many of us were dropped at a young age, and it left us crippled. That crippleness can be rejection. That crippleness can be the molestation. That crippleness can be anger issue. It doesn't have to necessarily be in physical crippleness. Where were you at? Whatever age you were dropped. That's where you were stuck. So let me give you a lived experience. I was, when my mom kicked me out and I had to become homeless by myself, I was 16, right? So I was dropped. So you can say right there, he was dropped at 16. And when I was dropped at 16, um, 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 that's where I'm crippled at, right? So then later on in life, I was a 20 year old, 25 year old boy with a 16 year old temperament. I was a 20 year old, 25 year old man up until probably like 27 man with a 50, with a 16 year old reaction because that's where I was dropped. Who dropped you? That's the question that I got to ask some of you prophetically, who dropped you? And I want you to give them grace because maybe they didn't drop you intentionally because Mashifa Bay caretaker didn't drop him intentionally. She dropped him because she was trying to help. I had to learn to understand that my mom dropped me, not because she she probably didn't mean to drop me. She probably didn't mean to kick me out, but probably that's all she knew. And when I look back at her story, I'm looking at a woman who committed murder when she was pregnant with me and then was sent after she gave birth to me, she was sentenced to do seven to eight years in prison. And then I didn't meet her until I was eight years old. And I'm wondering, like, what did she go through in Jamaica? Not even America prison, Jamaica prison. And she could have died because I, it was a situation where she was being jumped, she was stabbed, she was being hit in the belly all while I was in the stomach. So she could have died, I could have died. It so happened that she's a fighter. So she got up, she stabbed the man, he died. She gave birth to me, she went to go do time. I don't know what happened to her when she was in prison for seven, those seven, eight years. So maybe when she dropped me, maybe when she gave me some harsh words and some tough love, maybe that's all she knew. It wasn't intentional. She didn't do it with the intention to hurt me. And when God gave me that revelation, I was mad. I didn't forgive her right away. And I didn't show her grace right away. I was mad because I'm like, well, God, that ain't my problem. It was her responsibility to go get therapy and counseling. But then he said to me, Irene, you know the Jamaican culture don't believe in therapy and counseling. And when he began to speak to me, I began to give, to give my, my mom grace. I begin to give my mom grace because she did her best. So, so you got to understand that you were dropped. So a lot of the things that you're dealing with is not because you're in sin. Don't get me wrong. There's some of the things that is a consequence of your sin. Because let me tell you something. God forgiveness doesn't negate consequences. Let me say it again. When God forgive you, there's a clean slate. It's a new mercies, but it doesn't always negate the consequence. When, who was it? I think it was when David did what he did and like got Bathsheba's um, man killed because he wanted to be with Bathsheba. God forgave him, but he still sent Nathan to rebuke him. So not because there's forgiveness means that it, there's no consequence. You have already done the act of sin. Let me tell you something. Sin is a seed that conceives something. So if you already done the act of sin, there's something in the there's something being conceived. So even though God forgave you, <laughs> that can that can see that thing that's in that's that's being conceived is gonna birth sin birth something sin birth things. And a lot of times when we put, when we operate in sin, sin give birth to something, and then we end up feeding that thing. So 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 yes, you are forgiven, but sometimes there's a consequence that still come after the forgiveness. So there are certain things that you may be navigating because of the act of sin. 
we get that. I'm not saying that that, that that's not true, but it's not entirely the, the, always the case. There are certain things that you're dealing with not because of your own sin or your own doing, your bloodline. You don't know what your great, 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 great grandmother, grandfather, your ancestor did. You don't know what's in your bloodline. So certain things that you're dealing with is a bloodline thing, nothing to do with your action and your behavior. It's in your bloodline. That's why sometimes when you're praying, your praying is good to address your bloodline, to ask the Lord to deal with the generational things. So that's a myth that we have to debunk. It is not always you. Sometimes it's your, your bloodline. It's your generation. Sometimes it's a person that dropped you unintentionally. And you want to understand, and when you begin to understand that, then you don't beat on yourself. Because one of the worst things to do is to be dealing with mental illnesses on top of beating on yourself. So imagine going through, excuse me, going through ang um, um, anxiety and depression, and then you're beating on, beating on yourself on top of that. That's, 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 that's just going to enhance the mental illness and decline your mental health. I have like four more, right? So, 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 um, the, one of the myths that we want to debunk is just that there's a myth that say, if you love Jesus or if you love God, you shouldn't be battling with trauma and mental illnesses. It's not true. It, you, you know, you could love God and be in love with him, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to navigate mental illnesses. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have to navigate trauma. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, we still have to. Fortunately, we still have to because we're a human being. I think a lot of people in the body of Christ are forgetting that we're human being. And that's the sad part because God didn't forget that we're a human being. You want me to show you why? How I know? Let me give you scripture. Morning by morning, new mercies we see. Why would he feel the need to give us new mercies? That's a lot of mercies. New mercies every morning? Why would he feel the need to give us new mercies every morning? Because he knows that we're a human being. He knows that we're imperfect. Let me tell you something. One of the function of the flesh is to break covenant. The flesh is a covenant breaking device. One of the, one of the habit of the flesh is to break covenant. So, 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 there, so even when you love Christ and you're following him, wholeheartedly, it doesn't mean that you still won't battle certain things. You will. Look at David. David was the man of God's own heart. He killed Goliath, a giant. But then we read the Psalms and we see so many times David falling into despair and depression, right? Um, this is going to get a lot of people mad, but I'm going to say it because I have scripture for it. Another myth that we want to debunk is that we serve a God that is a God of, that, that we, how can I word this? Because I want to be very careful how I word this. Another myth that we want to debunk is just that when we walk with God, we always have a happy ending. So because I'm walking with God, he's going to heal me from this chronic disease. Sometimes he won't. We don't know what the thorn in, in Paul's flesh was. He talks about the thorn, the thorn in his flesh, that he asked God to take it and God allowed it to stay. So certain things will remain as a thorn in your flesh to remind you that you're human. Sometimes God would allow certain things to poke you to remind you that you're a human being. So there's a myth that say that, you know, we serve a God where he's a God of happy handing happy ending and not because you walk with God means that the ending is going to the, the ultimate ending is going to be happy when we make it to heaven you know because we you know that's the that's the ultimate ending but I'm, when I'm talking about ending I'm talking about in real life like people may think that you know but as we're walking with God with real life it's always supposed to be like a happy ending like a Cinderella story a sleeping beauty a, sleep, a sleeping beauty story but let's look at Psalms 88 I think this is the only, I think there are two Psalms in the Bible that ends sad. They didn't, it didn't have a happy, a happy ending. And I want to first say that, you know, um, David didn't write every Psalm 
in the Bible. I don't think David wrote Psalms 88. I think it is, I, this is, it may be this person called he man. I'm doing a lot of some more research on that. So I'm not gonna, you know, ha ha I'm not gonna harp on that, but I don't believe David wrote this Psalms, but here, here what Psalms 88 said, right? And it's pretty short, it's like 18 verses. Oh Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. He's crying day and night. He sound, this sounds like depression. I've been there. <laughs> Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thy ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of trouble and my life draweth nigh to the grave. So he sounds like he want to die. I, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in the darkness, in the deep. Thy wrath lie hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Thou hast put me away, Thou hast put away my acquaintance far from me. So there's loneliness that's happening. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them. I am shut up and I cannot come forth. And he's saying that God did these things to him, this person that's going on here. So you, we, we see where like he's venting and he's projecting his negative experience that you, you did this to me. You're allowing this to happen to me. He said, my eyes mourn mourneth by reason of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon thee. I have stretched out thy hands unto thee. With thou, with thou shoes wonders to the dead, shall, the, why, why did I pick the, 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 the King James Version? <laughs> you know, all this thou and thou, but bear with me. <laughs> um, shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? Are thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark and, and, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? So he's, he's questioning God, right? And then he went on to say, but unto thee I have cried, Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer um, prayer prevent thee. Lord, thy castest thou off my soul. Why castest thou off my soul? Why hidest thou face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die. This is a man of God. He sounds like Elijah. He sounds like Jeremiah. I am afflicted and I'm ready to die from my youth up. So I mean, he, he said, I was been ready to die since I was a youth. Uh, um, while I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. You know, it's hard to focus on his love and his relationship with God because of things that's going. Doesn't that sound like us sometimes? Things that are going on in our life keeps us distracted. The terrors of life keep us distracted from the, from the love of God. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. 17, verse 17. They came around about me daily like water. They compasses me all about. 18, lover and friend has thou put far from me and mine acquaintances into the darkness. Where's the happy ending in that? I just read a whole scripture that sounds like straight depression, like a very sad poem that's very dense. And this is a man of God. Tired, not happy, and it didn't have a happy ending. I think there's another song. I think there's two songs that doesn't have a happy ending. I can't remember the other one right now. It ended sad. And this was a man of God. A mighty man of God. It ended sad for him. That's how he, that's how his narrative ended. That's how he, he finished talking about himself. So, so we want to understand that not because we love Jesus, not because we walk with him, that we won't battle certain things and it won't always end well. You know, I, I read, you know, there's a book called God's General that talks about like, you know, some of the generals that went before us, like, you know, William Seymour, like Smith Wigglesworth and um, A. Day, A. D. Allen and all of these good people. And when, when I read that book, right? I noticed that they were doing great works of God, but some of them were dealing with depression, addiction, um, 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 and all of these other stuff, and they were still doing great works of God, and some of them were not healed. Some of them, it was the addiction that killed them but they were still doing great evangelism and tent and revival, and, 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 and many of us are wishing that we had their mantle today. 
but it was the it was some of the, the sickness that they navigated that killed them, the addiction that killed them. We had one woman, I forgot her name. She couldn't just, she had no luck with men. She just kept, kept picking the wrong husband. And, and, it, and, and, and it caused her great depression. I forgot, I think it was Mary something, caused her great depression. And these were mighty men and women of God. And they still struggle with addiction, still struggle with um, um, depression and all these other things, right? Let, let's go down to an, um, the, another myth that we're going to debunk. Um, that your biological makeup doesn't have any impact on you. That's a lie. Your brain is going to have an impact on you. If your brain is tired, you're going to feel it. If there's chemical imbalance in your brain, you're going to feel it. That's, that's why... I pray when I pray, I pray about the brain. I don't see a lot of people do this, but there are times when I'm in prayer and I'm literally lifting up the brain. Lord God, pray over the, the pre, over the, the cerebral cortex, like the left and the right. Sometimes I anoint my head and I'm like the left and the right hemisphere of the brain. And I started listing it. One of the things that you can do is that you look, you can Google the different parts of the brain and their, and, and, and their function and you pray about it. So say, for example, you Google the cerebral cortex and it's responsible for making decisions and stuff like that. You can say, Father God, I put my, my cerebral cortex before you. Lord God, let every decision that comes from my brain be, be aligned with your will. Because the brain is here. It's a part of your body. The, if the brain is dead, the body is dead. We know that. So, so we can't say that the biological and the, gene and, the, and the genetic stuff won't affect us. That's a lie. It does. It can. And it does. Um, another myth that we're going to debunk is God doesn't care about your mental health. That's a lie. He cares about you as a person. God cares about you holistically. What does, and, and one of the things that the church lack, you see, is um, the church lack holistic ministry. What is holistic ministry? Holistic ministry is when you're, the word holistic by itself is when you're viewing somebody as a whole. You're viewing them in their cycle, social, bio, emotional state of being. Everything matters. It, even your environment. One of the things I had to learn as a social worker is that you cannot assist somebody without even, uh, and without understanding the environment that they come from. For example, if you're going to work with a Black man in therapy, if you're going to coach a Black man, you're going to have to understand the, 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 the stereotype that comes with being a Black man and, 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 and the, the, the pressure that comes with being a Black man or the pressure that comes with being a man of, a, a man of color or a woman of color. Your environment, your, and there are environmental factors that plays a role in your mental health and your state of being. That's why it's super important where you live. I had to run from the Bronx in New York City because I couldn't, the weight, the pressure that comes with the Bronx, I had to run. I thank God, I bless God every day that I wake up in a neighborhood where I could hear birds singing as opposed to when I was in Bronx, I was waking up with the dogs barking and somebody coughing because of the cigarette that's choking them right under my window. Your, your, your environment will impact you. So you wanna ask God, where do I live? Where do you want me to live? It, it does play a role, not just in the natural realm, but in the supernatural realm, because there are some environments that are dense spiritually, dense. The, the, the principality in, in the Bronx, bra. At one point, I feel like they was dragging me by my ankle and my head was just being hit on every side while I boom, boom, boom. <laughs> it's just like I was having a migraine. It, it was crazy. So you want it, it's very, you want to be very intentional about where you live. Environmental factors play a role in your mental health. Um, so God does care about your mental health. The, la the second to last one is get that getting help is a sign of weakness. Getting help is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of wisdom. I don't even need to elaborate too much on that. Getting help, it is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of wisdom. You have to, you know, one of the things about spiritual, a lot of people want to jump in spiritual warfare thinking that all they need to know is their enemy. No, no, no. Let me give you a spiritual warfare 101 lesson. Know thyself before you know thy enemy. You cannot go into any spiritual warfare without knowing yourself. You have to know thyself before you know your enemy because your enemy knows you. What does that mean, Arane? It means that you have to know your weaknesses. 
You have to know your strength. You have to know your triggers. There's certain things and certain people I don't hang around because I know it's going to be a trigger. It, don't let this the, the prophetic anointing on my life fool you. I'm still a human being. And you may catch me in a wrong day and step on my toe. And I may not speak in tongues. It may be a different language, but not tongues. And it doesn't mean that I'm less holy. Uh, so when, when you know your trigger, yes, you want to develop self-control. That's needed. And, and God will do a work in us so we can get to a point where we have self-control. But you have to know your triggers. You have to know your weakness. You have to know your... You, you cannot go in battle not knowing your Achilles heel. You have to know your weakness more than how the enemy knows it. So when he hits you in that hair area, you know how to bounce back. And, and when I say know your weakness, you're not knowing your weakness to harp on it or to magnify it, but you're knowing your weakness so you can create a plan, a plan to navigate that when your weakness chip in. Know your trigger so when you and so you can create a plan so when your trigger kick in, kicks in. When I was navigating addiction, uh, uh, and I and I and God brought me out of it, I stayed away from people that drank. I stayed away from people that used the substances, the substances that I used. And up until this day, I, I just need to stay away from it. I would never say, oh, it's been two or five years since I haven't fallen in addiction. So I can walk in the midst of somebody smoking weed and I won't fall. I'm lying to myself. So I stay away from the weed smokers. I stay away from the drinkers. I stay away from, because anything that can be a trigger, you got to know your trigger. And when you know your trigger, you know how to navigate when something has come to trigger you. Don't ever think you're big and mighty that you will never relapse. There's a, such a thing called relapse. Everyone is subject to relapse. We saw that with Elijah when he ran to the cave. And a lot of times, right? Hallelujah. God just said this to me. A lot of times you will relapse into sin or you will relapse in a bad habit, not from a heart posture kind of thing. As in that your heart don't want to do it, but 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 because you're, you're exhausted, the enemy knows when to get you, Bruh, The enemy used to wait until I was exhausted and tired at night to slip an idea of pornography, or to slip an idea of 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 of, of masturbation, or to slip in the idea. He comes at you. You you ever been halfway in and out of your sleep, and you're getting some thought. You're dozing off, and like, whoa, what is this thought coming from? He knows when to pull up on you. He's not stupid. He knows it's like a fight. It's like if you grew up in the hood all together, you know in the fight, you know, you know when to catch your, your 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 enemy off guard. Especially if you know that, yo, for me, when I grew up, grew up and I was a fighter, I grew up in the ghetto in Jamaica, and I grew up in the hood in America. I was a fighter. I'm five five. So there's a lot of people that are taller than me. So a lot of times in my fight, how I was victorious, I'm not coming for you head on. I'm waiting for the best way to grab you when you least expect it because I'm 5'5". Five, five. So when the enemy knows, Zufanandia, that he cannot manage you on a one-on-one -on -one battle, he cannot manage you on a face-to-face -face battle, he will wait until you're exhausted. He will wait until you're tired. He will wait until you're isolated. He will catch you in that moment of weakness. I won a lot of fight because I was able to catch those people off guard. He wasn't going to drag me. I'm 5'5". Five, five. I'm waiting till you least expect it. He thinks like that too. So you want to know thyself. It's not a sign of when you ask for help, you're basically saying, hey, I know myself. I'm about to break right now. Help me. Ask any one of my friends or my close circle. I'll be the first one to run to my back. Yo, I need help. Pray for me. I'm about to do this. And, I, and I, I had to first learn to do it with God before I could do it with my friends. And people used to think I was crazy when I said it. I used to say to God, like, God, I need you to do something right now. Because if you don't do something right now, I'm about to pick this bottle up and turn it to my head. And that blunt is about to be my best friend. I just, I, all I knew was how to be transparent with him. I learned how to be a, a I learned him as a father first. Then afterwards, I learned him as a king. So I knew how to just come to him as a son. And be like, yo, I'm about to mess up. Yo, God, you better get your daughter, you better get your son, because if you don't get your son, I'm about to hit him upside the head. They don't know who they're playing with. I'm already in Williams. <laughs> and I would say stuff. I would say stuff like that with God, but that was just me being transparent and confession. It wasn't me being lack of reverence or lack of respect to God. I gave you, let me tell you something. God can't fix what you don't give him. And a lot of times we want to walk around. Uh, uh, we want to walk around and we want to put up a facade. But when you go to a doctor 
And if you go into the emergency room and you're having a headache and a backache, and you only tell the doctor about your backache, he's going to give you the remedy for your backache, but you're going to walk out of that hospital with a headache still because you only told him a part of your symptoms. Stop going. The presence of God, the presence of God is an emergency room. Stop going in the emergency room of God, only giving him some of your symptoms. And then when you come out partially healed, you're wondering why you're not fully healed because you didn't give him the full symptoms. Lastly, there's a myth that say, you know, I think, I think everybody do this, but I love my Nigerians. I love them so much. I was saying to one of my, my sister in Christ, the, yes, earlier, I was like, I feel like I'm Nigerian. I'm, a, I'm part Nigerian. I got to do the ancestry test to see if I'm Nigerian because I just love them so much. But there are some Nigerians that believe that they need to go all night in prayer, no sleep, days of prayer, no sleep. You need sleep. We serve a God that do not slumber nor sleep so you can sleep. He doesn't slumber, nor does he sleep, so you can sleep, so you can rest. So you need sleep. You need rest. And let me talk to you about rest. When, when rest and sleep is two different things. You can sleep and not be rested. You can sleep and not be rested. So, so, so not because you go to sleep and you could get eight hours of sleep and still wake up tired. Rest has to do with your mind and your heart. So uh, if you want to experience true rest, you have to deal with the issues of your heart and your mind. I did a research and the research said to me that the heart communicates to the brain more than the brain communicates to the heart. Follow me where I'm going here. That's what scientific research said, right? Then the Bible said that from the heart flows the issues of life, right? So, and then one day God said to me, Arain, what is the heaviest organ in the body? I said, I don't know, you know. And I said, what is it? And he said, the heart. And I said, well, how is the heart the heaviest organ in the body? He said, well, the heart does more than pump blood through the body. It carries the issues of life, right? So if biblically the heart carries the issues of life, and if scientifically the heart communicates to the brain more than the brain communicates to the heart, there's a lot of times where your heart is communicating to your brain the issues of life. And your brain becomes overwhelmed because the heart is telling your brain the issues of life. So sometimes when you want to experience real rest, you got to empty your heart. Release it. I don't hold nothing. I don't hold grudge. You see, once I tell you how I feel about what you did, that's it. I'm free. And I'm going to tell you. There's nothing you're going to do under this sun that affects me that I'm going to walk around and keep. I'm not a fridge. I'm not, I'm not a refrigerator. I'm not built to hold anything. <laughs> and I'm not saying I can't hold somebody's secrets and, and confidentiality, right? So, 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 so you know, I, I, I know the art of confidentiality. So I'm not talking about breaching confidentiality. I'm not talking about you can't trust me with a secret. That's not what I'm talking about here. But when it comes to hurt and pain and, 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 and pressures of life, I'm not holding those things inside. I was in, we weren't made to hold things inside. You want, you want me to tell you how I know that we weren't made to hold things inside? We have so much exists on our body. We have the area where we do number one. We have the area where we do number two. And your whole, the biggest organ is your skin. Your whole entire skin is full of pores. If you drink liquor right now, you sweat and the sweat comes through your pores. So we are created to release, to exit things, to give off things. But we want to walk around and be strong because we think being strong means holding everything inside. I'm not doing that to please anyone. Because I'm the one that's going to be pressure. I can't have sleepless night for anyone because I have to minister. I have to pour into people. So if there's something that's bothering me, I will communicate it. I will say it. I will get it off my chest. And once Irene gets it off his chest, I don't have no qualm with you. If you want to have a qualm with me because I kept it real, and that's on you, mama, but I already said it. So the last myth that I want to debunk is that you, 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 you need rest. And when I say rest, it's not just sleep. What is going on in here that you're carrying that you haven't released? What is going on in here that you, that you haven't emptied? You have to empty out yourself. God can't give you new wisdom. He can't give you new revelation. He can't give you new anything. He can't even fill you up until you make room. But we are walking around with so many things 
in our heart and our mind and our soul that we haven't released and it's impacting our mental health. It's impacting our mental health. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, what are we talking about next week? So we just debunk, right? The myth, the myth of um of mental health. Next week, I want next week I'm going to be talking about emotionally healthy, spiritually wealthy. So I want to I'm going to talk about how your emotion is connected to your spiritual, your, your spiritual state of being, how the two works hand in hand, how the two are necessary, how the two are important. 